Okay, I, th I think everybody heard that message, so we are now being recorded. Um, and I will just go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning again. Uh, welcome to the webinar on Joint Leadership Teams, A Smart Way of Doing Business. Uh, we have Jim Cole, Sandra Kennedy, and Sandra Simon of Ohio's Labor Management Cooperation Program uh, presenting this session today. And this session is part of the webinars that they are doing as a group and part of the webinars that we at the Ohio Employee Ownership Center slash the Business Succession Planning Program are uh, putting on this, uh, this uh, fine wet spring that we're having. <laughs> um, so I think without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and as a way of background, uh, we were going to supposed to have a uh, additional presenter here today. His name is uh, Michael Loges. He is the director, uh, well, not the director, but he is the coordinator of the Ohio's Labor Management Cooperation Program uh, with the Ohio Department of Development. And unfortunately, he had a last minute meeting come up, so he was not going to be able to make it. Uh, but he wanted to have us give a little background on the program. And as the slide says up here, uh, in today's economy, every business needs every competitive advantage you can get its hands on. And we in the program are, and it's really the topic of today's uh, webinar, are very concerned in how do we help you get there as, uh, as part of this program. So the Ohio Labor Management Cooperation Program works to preserve jobs in Ohio by providing a lot of services. Some of them are listed here on the slide, work site training, assessment, uh, facilitation, and other support. And uh, the funding is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, part of the Ohio Department of uh, Development. And it's a network. Uh, one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is being a, a well-functioning cooperative network around the state of nonprofit organizations that uh, hopefully, uh, and we feel that we do, play a significant role in uh, fostering Ohio's prosperity. So we work to involve everyone in the organization to maximize um, all the good things that can happen in business, whether it's innovation, flexibility to meet the demands of you know, global competition, local competition, increased employee pro productivity. All those things are important for a small business in Ohio, well, large business as well, to keep Ohio's economy moving forward. And we firmly believe, I think everyone uh, will agree with me, the presenters and Michael and myself, that working together, employers and employees can develop strategies to really make Ohio a world-class economy with a group of um, So that's a little bit of the background. And I think um, we will just go ahead and turn it over to our first speaker. Thank you. Good morning. This is Sandy Simon. And uh, just, just to get us started, I wanted to talk a little bit about what labor management cooperation is and is not. And um, sometimes we can look at things and think that they might be a flavor of the month. I think we know what that is. And um, also, some of us tend to look for a quick fix um, for whatever ails us. And labor management cooperation is not a quick fix. Um, I'll tell you, the, the uh, flavor of the month looks something like this. That, you know, some leaders attend a conference or read the latest, greatest book. And then, with all good intentions, plop this new program in front of everyone at the facility, which is followed seemingly in short order by the next latest, greatest book or program. Um, you know, and more than ever, changes in information happen at a great speed, 24-hour cycle, and many effective ideas can fail or fall victim even to the flavor of the month syndrome due to time and resource constraints. Um, we all learn from you know, the people like Tom Peters, Jim Collins, Ken Blanchard, and others, and yet it's difficult to establish and then maintain many of these um, programs. Even though everyone learns something from each program to something that helps us work better to another level, labor management cooperation, joint leadership teams are different than any program. Labor management cooperation is a process and is developed and strengthened over time. Labor management cooperation provides a framework to jointly lead the facility to, um, for joint leadership of programs and how to implement programs, which ones to implement, how to engage your employees, and so on. Labor management cooperation and a joint leadership team increases a facility's capacity and impact to grasp and develop opportunities for growth. Labor management cooperation does require a leap of faith, building trust, I'll say trust again, one agreement at a time, and a commitment to the facility and all of its employees, labor and management. 
Again, labor management cooperation is not quick. It's not a program. It is a process. And that is more effective in Ohio than anywhere else. The history in Ohio of labor management cooperation brings an expectation that facilities will work through their problems together, take on opportunities together, and grow their facility together. Labor management cooperation is a better way of doing business. Ohio's Labor Management Cooperation Program provides labor management practitioners to help you with your joint leadership team, your labor management cooperation process. Your learning curve will be shorter, not quick, but shorter than anywhere else because Ohio means jobs, and we're serious about this. Um, and with that, Sandy Kennedy? Good morning. Sandra Kennedy here, and one of the things that I wanted to move us forward with is, okay, what do you mean a better way of doing business? How is it a better way of doing business? We talk about being smart about our work. SMART, of course, as we remember, stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Timely. And that's what working together allows us to do. It allows us to specifically address issues. It permits that shift away from traditional divisive roles where it's going to be my way or the highway. Uh, I have the only good idea. I don't want to hear other ideas. I don't want the engagement of everyone. But a, away from those divisive roles so that the entire organization and all of the folks there can concentrate on a mutuality of interest. We all have a mutual interest in saving our organizations and expanding our organizations. And as we start looking at what our commonalities are, then we look for ways to serve the whole organization that will give us the results of job retention and often growth. Working together is a way to continually improve on the workplace. Being able to identify what is it we need, how can we get there? And looking to those that actually do the work, those that are in the field, as well as those that we're trying to lead. It is about our processes, but it's also about our outcomes. What do those outcomes look like? By being able to address all of the elements that go into what we're doing and how we need to do it and what our outcomes need to be, that allows us as individuals to develop a much higher level of trust. That higher level of trust says, I now understand the, the challenges that you have, the, the issues that are perhaps some of the key issues to the problem that perhaps I didn't understand before, but by working jointly, we're able to see what those are. So what does that trust get us? Well, that trust even itself will enhance the overall quality of work life. Often we will have people that as we begin our work that say, if you can just keep my stomach from hurting when I pull into the parking lot, it will be better because we're all in such a divisive mode so often where we feel like we're not being listened to or we feel like our uh, information is not as important as someone else's information, then it allows a whole difference in how we feel about the quality of our work life. Having that also permits informed decision making. When we talk about informed decision making, from a leadership perspective, one of the things we talk with them often about is the absolute worst thing that could happen to a leader is being the last to know. And being the last to know means you're not getting the information you need to make the best possible decisions. Working together in a collaborative environment permits that information sharing. And that information sharing allows the best decision making. And that happens even during the most difficult business situations where the economy has changed, where there are issues with the economy, where there are problems in, um, in, in engaging the entire workforce. Whatever those business situations are, creating more of a partnership allows a greater trust that we're all in this together. So that moves us on into that better way of doing business, that cooperative environment, not just a committee, but the entire organization. And it's really designed to give everyone a voice. Not a voice to complain, but a voice to 
be a participant in what we need, how we need it, and what, what's the reality of what we can actually do about it. But it's a voice in an effort to achieve maximum benefits, not for just all parties, but how is it that we can strengthen our organizations kind of from the inside out. We can look at that organization internally. We can look at what are the challenges we have and how can we really retain not just the work, but the worker. Cooperation really engages all parties and it encourages those new ideas. We know um, with all of the organizations that we work with that one of the things that is critical for organizations today is working more effectively, more efficiently, more productively. And a lot of that comes from not only just continual improvement, but continual improvement comes from new ideas, from being innovative in what we do, for looking, at new, for looking for new concepts for what we are doing, and looking for solutions. And having that cooperative engagement allows those solutions to surface. It allows us to provide a focus on collective knowledge the knowledge of all of us involved, all of us engaged in the organization, rather than just a singular knowledge. There's nothing worse than a leader who doesn't have enough information and who has to come up with all of the only ideas. Instead, you need to engage your entire workforce. Of course, the individual doing the job may have the absolute best idea to the challenges to that job. So having that collective knowledge versus singular knowledge, and that will ensure our organizations and the folks that work there a greater understanding of what is the need, what is, and then allows us to move toward the commitment by all to solving those problems. Andy, As Yes? Uh, quick question. Yes. I work with a lot of small business owners. Uh, and many of them, by, by, by no means all, but many of them when you start talking about a kind of more cooperative workforce and a kind of more open workforce and more communicative kind of environment, uh, they're not really used to that. And they're, you know, there might be some kind of hesitancy to do that. Do you find that often in the companies that you deal with that there's kind of, for the companies that don't already have that kind of culture in place, that there's a kind of, uh, resistance to wanting to do something like this? We do. We do find that in the, in the beginning. One of the reasons to really engage individuals who like this program that works with this kind, these kinds of projects is if you have a process, it makes people a lot more comfortable in understanding how this process is going to work. It's not an open, chaotic, uh, just uh, do anything you want. Instead, it's what are you doing in a process that allows the conversation, then the problem solving. For instance, we use a very specific smart action planning. We use a very specific uh, six-step problem solving process where you engage everyone in gathering the information and being able to deal with that information. But again, it's not a way to say anything you want and do anything you want, but it's a process of how are we going to gather the information from each other and jointly look for the best solutions. The best solution may be to buy a $3 million machine. Well, we can't do that. So there needs to be a clarity of understanding about what the things are we can address. It is not a quick fix. It is not a way of eliminating, if you're in a unionized environment, your union. It's not a way of doing any of those things. Instead, it's a way of jointly finding out what are the issues that we really need to be addressing, and how can we be committed to finding solutions for those things? Right. So I, it's a clear process. Right. I, I agree with that. We do some, a lot of team problem solving training here as well, and sometimes we get some pushback from the participants that they don't want to stick to the, to the rules that we give them to do the process. But I really believe that if you do stick to the rules, it makes it a much more orderly, fair, um, process and it's not a free-for-all where everyone's on their own and the old kind of behaviors kind of start to take you know, control of the situation. So I, I would agree with you 100%. Exactly. And that leads us into, into this next slide where we talk about the collaborative, collaborative process. It it's actually provides a vehicle. And by having a good process for how we are going to work together, it 
gives us that greater participation where we can not only identify, but we can analyze, and then we can move towards that problem-solving process. And really, that permits more time devoted to problem-solving versus the previous divisive or conflict kind of situations. And often, it will allow us to be preemptive into some of those things that might lead to a conflict at a later date because there's additional information sharing. There's additional um, education on how to problem solve and how to move forward together. And really that, what that does is that allows us a faster, more effective way of finding those solutions, discovering what they are, and actually the implementation. Because again, as individuals, we are much more committed to, being, to participating in implementing something if we really understand it and we've had the opportunity to be engaged in that. So participation really establishes not just what we're doing, but it really establishes an attitude that really values and nurtures and supports that open climate of information sharing. Again, it is not an opportunity for everybody to know everything about everything that's going on. Instead, it's what at what part at should I as an individual be engaged in? Where is it that I need to be involved in having uh, not only this conversation, but being engaged in doing something about what I actually do on a daily basis? So that information sharing can not only avert those conflicts, but it allows organizations, committees, teams, whole organizations to both be proactive and reactive in a problem-solving way, in a very clear problem-solving way. So as we look at the, the time that we can devote to what we need to be doing to be more productive, more effective, more efficient, then the collaborative experience allows organizations to encourage, support, and implement solutions at the most direct side of the problem. In other words, we drive it down. One question was asked of me previously was, well, which employees should really be involved in this? And the example I often use is from my dentist. My dentist said, only floss the teeth that you want to keep. So from a collaborative experience or from a, from a collaborative environment, you only focus on and permit engagement of the individuals that you want to do the best that they can possibly do for your organization. And of course, that's everyone. So drilling it down to the most direct site of where the issues are, where the challenges can be, and maybe not, it's not even a challenge. Maybe it's an opportunity to do something different that's going to really improve the organization. And that allows us the folks that are going to be impacted the most, the opportunity to be committed to resolving those issues, those that are most familiar and most impacted by the issues. That permits our teams and our individuals to more effectively deal with not only these long-term challenges that we talk about often, but our short-term, our daily, our everyday challenges. All of these things, the entire co collaborative environment, the cooperative workplace, it, the, one of the best outcomes is that ensures the best customer response. And we all know that having the best customer response and addressing our customer issues gives us the biggest competitive edge. Let me move on to Jim. Thank you, Sandy. I think we've all been in the workplace scenario where someone comes in and announces a new policy or a new procedure. And the general reaction from the workforce is, who came up with that idea? How could they possibly decide that? It doesn't look like the person who made the decision really understands what's going on. Or we go into a corporation or an office many times and we see on the wall the mission statement or the vision statement. And they're very artfully done and framed and put up on the wall without any thought ever being given to how do we bring everybody together to move towards that vision. 
It's as if making a decision or putting something on the wall was immediately going to get everybody to buy into it. Yet many times we do these things and we make these decisions, we make these changes, and everybody just kind of sits back and thinks, that'll go away in enough time, we'll just sit back. Unless we get people in the workplace involved in decision making, involved in making changes, and involved in implementing policies, we don't get buy into them. We don't get the, the workforce to commit to them. We don't get a chance to move towards accomplishing that mission and that vision. One of the things that we very firmly believe in is nobody knows more about a job than the person that does the job. You know what works, and you know what doesn't work. You know how things are done. You know what your customers want. Uh, in order to, to move the organization forward, we've got to have the opportunity for people to be involved in the decision-making process, to use that expertise, and when they do, we've got an opportunity to make real lasting change within our organizations. Think about it. Would you rather be told what to do or be asked for your input? When you're told, there's immediately some resistance. It's a change, and we don't like change. Change is difficult. We're just being told what to do. I don't have any opportunity to say, to question it, or to look for the reasons why. But if we're asked for our input as part of the change process, if we're asked what we think, we can use that expertise, we can use that knowledge that we bring to the job, and then we've got an opportunity to be part of the decision-making process. We've got an opportunity to be part of looking at the work system, deciding what pieces of that work system need to be changed, and having an opportunity to, to, to be part of implementing what's there. Now, we're not talking about just going out and asking somebody, what do you think, and moving on. We've seen organizations where the idea of participation was, once we've already made the decision, we'll ask people what they think and do what we wanted to do anyway. It's got to be real participation. If we try to do just window dressing, it won't work. If people don't feel they're really being listened to, it's going to have a negative impact. We want to be sure that we give people the opportunity to be heard and to use that expertise, be part of that change process. And when we do, we've got more buy-in. By being asked, people are going to be more likely to support the decision that's there. If they feel that their input has been listened to and their input has been used in the process, they're going to support that decision, and we've got a better chance to move things forward rather than just have the decision die when it, when it hits the floor. Involving everybody in the problem-solving process builds relationships in the workplace. It can help build communications. And when we do that, We've got to carry over also into our entire workplace, not only in that decision, but people now feel like, I am being listened to. I do have a voice in what happens here. They think I have value. People better understand what's going on, their role in the work system, their role in producing that product or service, and why it's important. When they understand the, the, the outcomes, when they understand why things are to be done, they're going to be more likely to, to support it and be part of the process. The other thing that happens is we remove the them versus us from decision making. It's not they decided this or someone said, it's we, we decided, we made the call. This is what we think is best. We build trust, we build morale, and we've got a chance to make a real difference in our workplace. The other thing that happens is the more people we involve, the more that expertise we share, the more viewpoints we consider, the better the quality of the decisions are that we make, and the more likely it is we're going to be able to really improve our organization. When we've got that buy-in, when employees are involved, we develop those understandings, we build that sense of ownership and commitment in, in our uh, employees, in everybody in the workforce, and as we do this and, and involve labor and management, we've got a common voice to workplace decisions. People understand it, people are, are behind it, and we've got to develop that unity within our workplace. The other impact that this has is we can improve customer service. Effective customer service is essential for anybody. If we don't serve our customers well, they don't keep coming back to us. Sometimes we feel as customers that we're neglected, we're ignored. When we do that, we build no loyalty to that particular workplace. We build no loyalty to their product or their services. We just assume go someplace else. By involving employees and management together, 
we can better improve the customer service process. Employees and management can work together to look at customer complaints. They can analyze what customers are saying to us, what it really means to us in our system of production, and how we can better turn that system of production to meet what the needs of those customers are. We can look at ways to improve the production system. By using customer feedback and sharing customer feedback with employees, we can build on the strengths in our organization and we look and look at the opportunities to deal with problems that customers see. Involving people in customer service also builds a sense of value in those employees. They feel like they've got the opportunity to interact with customers. They must think I'm important. They must think I'm worthy of being able to do that. They have the opportunity to hear directly from the customers what, what's happening. They can work together with management and employees to determine what are the best solutions to the customer concerns, but they can also look at what new things can we be doing? What additional services or products might we be able to offer to meet not just the basic needs of what our customers have, but also to help meet the, and, and identify their expectations? When we do that, again, we've got the opportunity to improve our product, we've got the opportunity to improve our service by involving everybody. That is one of the real strengths that, that comes from involving everyone in the workplace. Jim? And Simon's going to tell us about the next process. Jim? Yes. We have a question that, that I think goes back to the buy-in, employee buy-in. We have a, a question from one of the participants. Um, essentially, the question is, what about those decisions that you've tried to get employee buy-in, but they don't buy in, but you still feel that it's a it's a, it's a beneficial decision for the company moving forward or the organization. How, do you, how would you handle those types of situations where you've tried to get buy-in, weren't able to get it, and, but you still got to go ahead with the, the, with the decision anyway? You know, that really doesn't happen very often because if employees have the opportunity for input, but also they have the information shared with them that was the basis for the decision, the employees have the opportunity to, to understand why, the, why decisions are being made, why things have to happen that, that are being presented. Usually we, we find in those situations there still is better buy-in to them because now they understand. It's not just somebody saying, beginning tomorrow, you will do it this way. Now they, they've got that basis, and now it's easier for them to accept that decision and move forward. All right, great. Thanks. And for the participant that asked that, let us know if, if uh, you need some additional um, explanation on that, but I think that would answer the question pretty well. Thanks, Jim. I guess we're moving to the other Sandy. Okay. Hello, I'm back again. This is Sandy Simon, and I wanted to talk about um, labor management cooperation and the ability to address over overarching issues in a facility. Um, this is something that I have, have seen in um, my work over several years with uh, lots of labor management leadership teams. And you know, every facility is impacted by overarching issues. Those issues that come from outside the facility, perhaps, such as market-driven challenges like competition, or um, the overall world economy, big, big topic, I know. But how about those corporate directives that sometimes come to our facilities? And then, you know, that customer of ours. How about those new customers of ours? And how about our current customer service? And what about those increasing demands our customers make on us? Um, and how about our training needs, right? All through the facility there are training needs, workforce development, maybe some gaps that need to be shrunk. And there are many more, of course. Those are just, just a few um, issues that I think uh, we've worked with over the years. But where might you start with your joint leadership team? And maybe, maybe your leadership team has been successful for a couple years, um, and you're kind of hanging steady, but what, you know, you're not sure what's next on the horizon. An overarching issue can be a good place to start, um, such as you know, safety is a big one. Who, who can argue about taking care of safety? And also workers' comp. We might be able to argue about how to take care of it, but that's what I call good conflict management and, and getting good ideas out. Um, <clears throat> but also, think about those things, those issues that you, your labor management people always end up talking about, that you're both passionate about, even if there seems to be a difference about why you're passionate about that same issue, there's still a point of agreement there. 
And um, if, if I were working with an organization and I'm listening to the group, that's exactly what I would be looking for, are those points of agreement that people have energy around. And that's a good place to start. And what you do is you take that issue and you develop a plan together on how to address it while taking care of employees and reducing costs. What could be better than that? You can make a direct hit to increasing buy-in and engagement from all employees and a direct hit to your bottom line. And what could be better than that? So prior to this, we were talking about in the trenches, direct to the employee. Now we're looking at, okay, what about these overarching things that impact our business? How do we take those on as a leadership team, which I just described to you, and then we take them into the trenches and get the input and, and start um, making an impact with that. Um, <coughs> further, we can go into, um, <coughs> excuse me, labor management cooperation and um, the ability to reduce costs. And that would be the next slide. And this isn't just about reducing costs. It's about reducing costs that make sense for everyone. Groans and gripes can be either nagging annoyances or feedback for improvement. And when a joint leadership team promotes and supports a philosophy of problem solving at the lowest possible level, those incremental improvements add up to savings. Involving others in decisions, as was mentioned before by Sandy and Jim, <coughs> excuse me, um, I lost my place. Oh, adds up to savings and also that buy-in, which are so critical. People are really, really smart. And if we take the time up front to talk with them, get their information, give them information, it's a smoother and more effective approach to engage employees and allow them to help shape the implementation of changes in their work. Um, the question earlier was how do we get people to buy into the decision? Well, maybe we can't. But maybe we can ask them and say, this is what we've got to do. Can you figure out how to help us implement it? And sometimes just helping implement it helps a lot to improve employee buy-in. And then it adds to your bottom line sooner. I know that the above two bullets are kind of broad in scope, but they're pointed in their effectiveness and relies heavily on two-way communication. And again, if I was going to focus on something, that would be what I would be going after, is that two-way communication in all areas. Sometimes we can say three, four, or five-way communication, right? But that's what's critical, the communication at all levels in your organization, especially labor management. It works, it works, it works. And um, with that, on to Sandy Kennedy. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, again, when we start talking about productivity, we start talking about what are the opportunities that this cooperative environment really uh, allows us. Is it allows us an opportunity to base our actions, our activities, on honest and effective communication. Sandy was talking about two-way communication. Absolutely. We recognize that miscommunication is often what will uh, create misunderstandings, create initiatives or, or actions that can become conflicts. So we recognize that effective communication is understanding what we need to know, but getting it when we need to know it. And that gets us back to why is this a smart way? What, because smart is not only the specifics of a situation, but it's also timely. Knowing today or knowing tomorrow? Do I want to know before it happens or after it happens? I may not agree with the decisions that are made, and it may not be exactly the way I would have chosen it to be, but if I at least understand it and I know about it and I understand the reasoning behind it, I still may not like it. But that doesn't mean I'm not engaged and committed to making it happen if I have, if that's the direction that we need to be going. But having that honest communication where we honest is not an excuse to be rude. It's, an, it's an, simply an opportunity to give the information that I need in order to operate in a way that I feel is going to be the most effective. Uh, 
because it is certainly in my best interest to be able to uh, continue my continue the operations at, at my workplace. It's certainly in my best interest to have a better quality of work life. So being able to look at what's happening and what's company, coming, I then can be somewhat proactive. And if I'm proactive, I can help to avoid mistakes that could occur. And that all together can help us to improve the overall productivity and effectiveness at virtually every level in our organization. We cannot just be effective at the top. We cannot just be effective at the bottom or productive at the bottom. It has to be a whole system approach. You have to look at the entire organization and say, how are we engaging each other? Everyone, every individual in your organization that you eliminate from that conversation, that's a new innovative idea or opportunity that you may be losing. So the cooperation, the communication, and the connection to productivity has to be the product of both leadership and the workforce. You have to be looking at how are we engaging each other to be able to work together. When we talk about it from working together, often people will go, oh, well, that's those soft skills. That's that philosophy of cooperation. While it is absolutely a philosophy of working together, a, philo a philosophy of, uh, if everyone is familiar with the book Getting to Yes and Fisher and Urey, it's a very small book, but it very clearly identifies what are the steps, what are the opportunities to be able to take that philosophy into action. Because cooperation is directly tied to the outcomes that organizations can achieve. It, clearly, it can clearly identify the commonality of interest. And certainly, a big part of that interest is our survivability and expansion, not just to the whole organization, but when we start talking about a collaborative environment, we're talking about our communities as well. So it's expanding into how is it that we're working together for survivability. Being able to look at what we're doing, how we're doing it, and being able to not only identify but deliver on what are the options for mutual gain. Mutual gain does not have to be a, a financial entity. It can be mutual gain by improving our workplace, mutual gain by not having the, the conflicts that we've had in the past. Mutual gain by identifying how we can continually improve on my daily activities that makes my life better. So working together to identify both the current state, where, where are we right now as an organization, and our future state, where do we want to be? And then being able to jointly come up with, these, this is the gap between those two things, and how can, I, how, how can I be part of making sure we get to our future state? So being part of the strategic planning, doing my part, knowing where I fit, looking at continual improvement, and the promotion of real commitment by everyone in an organization to the ongoing improvement of the work, the workmanship, and the partnership leads us all forward to a much more productive future. Sandy? I think it's Jim. Jim? This one's mine, Sandy. Thank you. One of the real keys to a, a cooperative labor management process is it enables the organization to become more competitive by everybody working together to look at how do we improve the system. If we engage in a traditional labor management relationship, we spend a great deal of time as labor and as management treating each other as natural enemies. We spend time, we spend resources, we spend our, our efforts in competition with each other. But that's not where the competition is. If the competition you're facing is within your organization, you have some very serious problems because it shouldn't be there. It should be facing that, uh, that outside competition that's very good and is very strong. But working together, labor and management can find ways to improve efficiency and improve productivity using that knowledge that each of them has within the workplace. We can use that experience to help craft the best solutions to problems. 
we can use that, that knowledge and that experience to help identify the areas where a system needs improvement and then work together to, to make those improvements. There's the old saying that together we're smarter than any of us. And that's absolutely true in our workplaces. Our workplaces today are much more complex. They're much more difficult. Uh, the, the need to be part of that global marketplace, the, the need to make sure that we're doing things in the best way possible means we've got to be able to work together to get there. Jointly addressing workplace issues can cut costs because we can find ways to improve the system of production. We can find ways to do things better. We can find ways to improve our overall flexibility in order to better design our workplace, in order to, re to reduce costs. And we can look at some of those workplace issues that have been around for, uh, for a long time in many of our workplaces. Absenteeism, safety. There are many others that sometimes we, we do window dressing type approaches to. We talk about absenteeism without ever asking the really tough question of why is it occurring? Why are the situations such that we have a high degree of absenteeism? It's not just people deciding to take off. We need to know why it's being, why, why that is. We need to involve people in reaching those solutions. We need to involve people in looking at ways to improve safety. We need to involve people in looking at ways that we can remove bottlenecks in our workplace in order to improve the overall efficiency. We want to know that the things that we do in our work system are value added to the work process. The knowledge and the, the experience of the workforce, labor and management working together can help identify those bottlenecks, those cost added pieces, and look at ways that we can eliminate them. When we do that, we can look at problems that are much more complex than we could ever deal with before separately. We can explore new markets. We can look at new markets and services and find ways that we can implement them to improve the, the overall bottom line of our organizations. Employees and managers can work together to find ways to cut defect rates, to deal with some of those cost added issues, to cut down on the rework, to make sure that we're doing things the best way possible. We can improve quality by involving employees. That also increases their understanding of the overall procedures that we use in our workplace. Understand, improves their understanding of the work system. And it's absolutely vital if we're going to achieve ISO or other certifications that everybody know and understand exactly what those work, work processes are and the overall system of production. Labor and management need to work together on strategic planning. One side or the other can't develop a strategic plan for an organization because implementing that strategic plan without the involvement of both labor and management is impossible. Working together, we can think about the needs of the organization, develop that plan, develop the methods to get there, and everybody then can buy into that process. In a traditional labor management setting, we said before, we spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of money dealing with those traditional behaviors, trying to prove to each other that we have power or that we're right. In a traditional setting, we the only real way to solve problems is a grievance procedure, if we consider that to be problem solving. Grievances are very difficult because they take time. Sometimes they take a long time because labor and management don't communicate to try to resolve those grievances at the lowest level. But by working together, we can reduce the number of grievances. We can solve problems in a much more timely manner. We can do it more effectively. And that also helps us be more competitive because we can spend our time working together to improve our, our organization, not fighting within that organization. Sandy Simon, I think you're up next for, for job retention. Great. Thank you, Jim. Um, the, the whole crux of labor management cooperation and a joint leader to team is jobs and more jobs. Labor management cooperation is a parallel track to your collective bargaining agreement. It honors the agreements of the agreement and the grievance procedure has its purpose, while labor management cooperation promotes ongoing communication and employee engagement. Labor management cooperation provides the venue to be proactive rather than reactive. Open and honest communication is ongoing about removing barriers for employees to be able to perform at their best and keep ahead of the curve. Cooperation gives your organization the ability to find or create opportunities for growth and jointly develop and implement 
implementation processes, jointly launch and support groups, teams, cells, areas of work toward problem solving and improvement, especially employee engagement. Engagement and cooperation with all employees is critical for non-union facilities as well. Again, labor management cooperation, joint leadership teams is the framework from which to jointly lead your facility in its effectiveness, capacity, and success, which brings jobs, jobs, jobs. Ultimately, it's the best layoff aversion process I know, and it, this means good jobs for Ohioans. Um, and on the next slide, I just want to uh, take a moment to wrap up our, um, our presentation that we're here to help. Please let us know how we can help you and your company or your organization get started. The Ohio Labor Management Cooperation Program will be continuing this webinar series over the coming months and look forward to your future participation where the group will address issues that are important to you. Um, we bring processes to you to help you develop your, your joint labor management team. Um, you are the magic. We bring tools to help you do that. And one of the, some of the ways we do that is by avoiding, helping you avoid common joint leadership team pitfalls. Um, we know folks who can help you know what those are because they've been where you, uh, uh, where you want to not go, and they'll help you identify those. Um, safety is a great place to start. Trust and team dynamics, if there's a gem, it would be there. And repositioning your organization during an economic transition. And I'll tell you what, if I had to come up with something that we've been working on for a long time in Ohio, um, it's repositioning our organizations during an economic transition. Um, thank you very much for participating, for being here, and um, I will turn this back over to our chairperson, Chris. Thanks, Andy. Um, we got a, a chat question come in a couple minutes ago. Um, I wanted to wait till the good point. We're going to open up the phone lines uh, for questions here in a second, but I wanted to get this question an answered first. The question came in. Um, what is the typical size of a joint leadership team? Um, how many is too many? Um, what's the kind of the, the median between it being large enough to be effective, not too large, that it's a free-for-all? And I'll let you, Sandy, uh, since you're the one on, on the hook right now, I'll let you answer. Okay. I'd, I'd be happy to talk to that. I, I think that uh, we like to talk about um, stakeholders. Uh, your joint leadership team definitely needs to include your stakeholders, people who make the decisions. If the people um, on your joint leadership team have to go ask somebody else, leave the, the meeting or the decision making process and go ask somebody else permission to move forward, we don't have the right people on the team. Now, there's lots of studies around group dynamics, right, over and above who should be in the group, which is what I said about stakeholders, labor and management leadership. Um, it, you know, it could be two people, it could be four people, it could be 12. Um, I've been part of one that was 32. So it, it really depends on the, I think I've heard Jim uh, Coles talk about the commitment of the people in the group and then also what they're working on. If we did have a big group, when we had that group of 32, we've been on one that had 22. There was an executive team within that that met more often, sometimes multiple times during the week. Maybe it was that core team of uh, four and four. I hope that helps. Anybody else? Jim, Sandy, chime in. If I can jump in on that, Sandy, yes. Uh, and, and as you said, the real key is commitment. It's not the number of people in the room. It's not really the size of the group uh, in spite of all of the research on group dynamics. It's what commitment do the people who are there have to really identifying and solving problems. If we have that commitment in the room, whether it's six people or whether it's 25 people, they can get the job done. We, one of the best labor management teams we worked with was a team of 25. And we mentioned that to some people and say, how could 25 people ever really discuss something and come to consensus? It's because they wanted to. It's because they were committed to that. It's because they realized that unless they did, they weren't going to be able to solve problems that organization faced. On the other hand, I've been in teams of, of six to eight people, which uh, some of the research says that's the ideal group size. Those teams couldn't do a thing because they didn't have that commitment, because they really weren't interested in problem solving. They were interested in continuing the labor management game. It's commitment. Sandy, you're absolutely right about, about having the right people on the team. That makes more difference than the absolute numbers. 
Hey, if I, I'm sorry, Sandy Kenny, we had another question, in, but if you want to add in on that, please feel free. Yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing. When we talk about the joint leadership teams, while we talk about the core leadership team at the top, we also recognize that within a collaborative environment or a cooperative environment, there are mul uh, there's a multitude of uh, leadership teams at, ver at a variety of levels. And it has to be supported, of course, by the top leadership team, but recognizing, again, that it is commitment and support by that top joint leadership team to have those other collaborative teams throughout the entire organization. Again, it's a whole system approach, trying to engage everyone for positive results. Okay, great. Um, the other question that came in, Let's pull it up here. Uh, what about, uh, the question is quite uh, short, so what about uh, the model for businesses that aren't organized? So I'm assuming that, you know, the idea, what, the idea behind the question is that a lot of this has been traditional labor management cooperation has always been in the unionized setting. But I'm assuming that the questioner is asking, you know, is the model still applicable for a non-unionized setting and labor management issues, how that relates to a non-unionized setting? Yeah, if I could start with that, this is Sandra Kennedy. Another thing we talk about often is not just labor management cooperation, but cooperation in general. Every organization needs to engage their entire workforce. So creating joint leadership teams is certainly not merely owned by the unionized organizations, but by every organization. Being able to look at what is it we're doing, who needs to be on those teams, and are we really committed to working together in informed decision making and leading continual improvement efforts and can we be truly honest and create a trusting environment. Trust is critical in every type of an organization. Great. Um, I don't want to cut off uh, the other Sandy or Jim if they want to address that either, but we're running up against our time deadline. So what I was thinking about doing is opening up the phone lines at this point and asking uh, the folks who ask questions if we answered them correctly. You can certainly tell us if we, you know, if you want some additional information or if there's additional questions that you want to ask. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute everybody. So hopefully no one's got any crazy things going on in their office. The conference has been unmuted. So everyone is unmuted now. So let's just open up the lines for questions. Feel free to just dig right in. Hi, uh, this is uh, Michael from uh, Marietta. I had a question, um, uh, when should uh, joint leadership teams consider putting together a communication plan uh, to talk with their employees about this, this joint leadership process? Is that effective? Uh, when should this be addressed? If I can jump in on that one, that communications process is absolutely essential and needs to start at the beginning. Everybody in the workplace needs to be informed of what that joint leadership team is doing who is on the joint leadership team, the processes that they're working on, and also how they're going about it in that cooperative manner. If that doesn't happen, we, I've seen a lot of labor management leadership teams and, and labor management committees that seem to function as secret societies. The only people who knew what was going on were the people who were on that team. And if I went to the work floor and said, excuse me, who's on your labor management committee, people couldn't have told me. Those committees were completely irrelevant. If people don't know who's on the committee and they don't know what the team is working on, then the, the team has absolutely no meaning to them. And they have no way to get their concerns and their issues addressed by the team. The other thing we stress to teams is your communications has to be in a variety of different ways. Some camp committees say, you know, if we, we put out our minutes and we put them on the bulletin board or we send them out an email, and that's great for the people who stop by the bulletin board or take the time to open that, that email. It's usually a fairly low percentage. We've got to have a lot of different ways of getting that message out there. It's like advertising on TV. If they play the advertising one time or you only see it in one way, you forget about it very quickly. So it's got to be frequent, it's got to be varied, and it's got to be consistently done. Sandy, would you like to? Oh, absolutely. This is, this is actually my most favorite when I um, start up with a, a joint leadership team and they've worked very hard on what they want to accomplish. 
their first task at their very first meeting is to figure out their message to the rest of the whole facility and how they're going to roll that out. And uh, they uh, come together about what that message is, what it means, what they're going to tell people, and they're going to stand up together and do that. And um, just two weeks ago, I was with an organization out of Napoleon, and, and I went to all three all shift meetings um, uh, with them as they took an hour with each shift and rolled out their joint labor management team process. And um, it, was, it was a great start. And that is so critical that I will not let them leave until, leave that meeting that I'm with them when they're coming together so that they know they've got that together to roll out. That is critical. That communication starts immediately, as Jim said. Okay, great. Um, do we have any other questions? Sorry, I was working on uh, answering a chat message here. Do we have any other uh, verbal questions that we want to do, that we want to ask? Okay, um, I just put up a slide up here. Uh, thanks for all the part participation. Uh, put up a slide up here showing you the contact information for the three speakers and uh, myself as well. Um, for some reason, when I uploaded the slide, the, the two centers on the right, the formatting got messed up. But uh, we want to make sure you can hold it from the Columbus area and points southeast, I think. Uh, just a fair um, explanation of your area. Uh, for uh, Sandy Kennedy, she's out of uh, Dayton, I think, point directly north, and down to Cincinnati is roughly her area. And for Sandy Simon, uh, Toledo, uh, she covers the whole northern kind of part of the state. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, give us a uh, Sounds like we have a dog in the background. Um, that was fun. Uh, we, um, uh, <laughs> interesting. Uh, great. Um, thanks for muting that. I appreciate that. But uh, we can also, after we uh, finish with this session, we can un uh, uh, stop the recording process and see if there's any folks who want to ask some questions offline or get some additional information. But feel free to contact any one of us uh, if you have additional questions about what we talked about here. Um, and uh, Sandy and Sandy and Jim, do you have any uh, remaining comments that you'd like to uh, uh, speak of? Um, I would uh, like to ask everyone, uh, once, once you log off, if you would please uh, complete the evaluation that I think will pop up. Is that right, Chris? Yes, it should pop up automatically. Okay, and that would be greatly appreciated. This is our first foray into this, and uh, we want to get better at it and bring more pertinent topics to you. So um, uh, I, I really ask that you uh, complete those for us. One additional thing from Sandra Kennedy. Uh, one of the things we wanted to remind everybody of is, as Sandy said, this is our, our first opportunity to engage uh, all of you uh, in this uh, particular manner. We want you to know that we'll be continuing to do this, and our next one is going to be in regards to getting started. What are some steps to take? Again, reminding you it's a process. It's not a free-for-all. It is a process, and it's a real opportunity to look at our organization. So we want to make sure that we give you some of the additional steps to getting started. And we will uh, we'll be uh, rolling that out uh, sometime in July. Great. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank everybody for joining us this morning and for participating in the webinar. And we look forward to working with you again in the future. Great. Thanks, Jim. I was getting ready to say thanks for coming, and we'll talk to you later. But we had one more chat question come in. And this one is, who selects the members of the team, generally, I would imagine? In a joint labor management environment, uh, the management will pick the management members of the team. Labor will pick the bargaining unit members from their bargaining unit to be on the team. The one thing, however, we encourage people to do is pick people who will be open to, the, to a joint cooperative process. Sometimes when in, in a traditionally based organization where we deal with people who are used to traditional labor management environments, it's difficult for them to make the switch. We want to be sure that the people who are there are ready to work together and are committed to working together, but each team will pick its own participants. 
um, if I could add to that, in a in a non in a non union setting, one of the things we typically encourage is we we go in and we do a um, a form of a. Uh, a, a, what we call a front end analysis, where we gather information about why do you want to begin this process and how can it be in your best interest to do this. But often we look at who are your workforce uh, leaders because even in a non union environment, you have you will have uh, individuals who are your team leads, or often individuals who have a specific. Uh, background in uh, attempting to engage the rest of the workforce. We all know who our informal leaders are as well. So while the organization has the last word in who they're going to choose to be on these on these leadership teams, we help them to do that if they're in a non-union environment. And if I could chime in. Um, we started this a long, long time ago with the uh, advisory board of the Labor Management Center, and every leadership team, joint leadership team that I work with, will have the highest management person on it and the highest elected union official on it, and their immediate staffs. And um, from there, they will then pick their own, and then sometimes um, they even pick their informal leaders that Sandy Kennedy alluded to in a non-union facility, they are also in a unionized facility to also be a part to help moving that process forward. And I think, um, as you can see, there's lots of ways to slice this apple. But you, uh, the point is, is that there are methods out there that we can bring to you to help you make the right decisions for your facility. Okay, great. Uh, since we got that one last question, I'm going to ask one more time uh, if, uh, if there's anyone else who wants to chime in with a question on the phone lines. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone, for participating. What I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to turn off the recording, and then I'm going to open up the, the phones one more time to see if there's someone who wants to ask a question offline. And so I'll do that now. Thank you. Please stand by.